2.30, so we're excited to start today's conversation. For those of you that um, are not familiar with our webinar series, my name is Kelly O'Brien, and I'm the Executive Director of both the Alliance for Regional Development and the Chicago Central Area Committee. The Alliance for Regional Development was founded in 2012 as a result of a publication by the world's leading think tank, the OECD. And when the report was published, stakeholders from Wisconsin, Illinois, Indiana came together and created the Alliance as a neutral platform to bring together decision makers to identify areas for collaboration that could grow the regional economy. And clearly transportation is one of the areas that is a very important economic driver for our region and one that we want to make sure um, that we play a part in helping to, um, to bring people together. Um, Bob and Representative Nagel, can you hear me okay? Yep, I can. Yep. Can you hear you great. Excellent, terrific. So uh, throughout the many years, um, the Alliance has worked with the Midwest Interstate Passenger Rail Commission, MIPRC. And again, we have um, viewers from all over the Midwest. So if you're not familiar with MIPRC, it is a uh, eight state compact commission that promotes, coordinates, and supports regional improvements to passenger rail. I'll leave it to our speakers to discuss those eight states and a little bit more in terms of what the group does, but I know they have a very strong membership. They're very strong advocates in the transportation space, and it's really a pleasure to work with the leadership of MIPRC. So today's speaker, um, first we have uh, Bob Guy, and Bob currently uh, serves as the State Legislative Director for Illinois Smart TD, formerly UTU, and represents Smart TD on the U.S. Surface Transportation Board's Rail Energy Transportation Advisory Committee. And I know, Barb, that you have a long history of family um, involvement in the railroad. And I will tell you, I do too. Um, <laughs> yeah. My great-grandfather came to this country and worked on the railroad. And I grew up hearing about stories uh, that, you know, he was lucky enough to have a job in the Depression. And my great-grandmother um, helped feed the neighborhood because of that. So we're yeah. you know, very proud of, of our um, history and connection with the railroads. And then it's, it's truly an honor to have State Representative Sharon Nagel with us. And um, State Representative Nagel has served four terms as Indiana State Representative for West Central Indiana. And she has been MIPRC's designee since 2016 um, and a financial officer 2018. And she's been the designee to in, uh, designate Indiana's House of Representatives. So really an important uh, stakeholder, a very uh, powerful influencer, and we're so thankful to have both of you here today. Um, Bob, I understand that there was a rally earlier this morning. Did, can you tell us a little bit about what happened? Oh, absolutely. Uh, I can touch on a little later, but real, real quickly, um, uh, in four locations throughout the country today, in Chicago, New York, uh, Washington, D.C., and Los Angeles, uh, rail labor, rail unions, uh, put together informational rallies to try to highlight the fact that we do need another COVID relief package. We need more funding, you know, coming from the federal government um, because starting tomorrow, unfortunately, Amtrak plans on cutting most uh, long distance service instead of once daily long distance routes that they operate, um, a lot of which come through the Midwest and Chicago as, as a hub. Um, they're going to cut those back to uh, every three days service. Um, Obviously, our interest is in the jobs and layoffs that that will affect 2,000 uh, jobs across the country. Um, that's not including management jobs as well, but that leaves rural communities that rely on long distance service um, really, really hurts them. Um, those rural communities that don't have access to interstate highways or aviation, really the, the long district and track service is a lifeline uh, to get to urban areas, to get to, to, to doctors, to get to friends and family, and, and tourism travel. Um, so we're trying to do everything we can to highlight the need. There's more action, uh, I guess, this week. We're holding out hope, crossing our fingers, that some kind of an agreement um, can, can be had between the, the U.S. House leadership, U.S. Senate, and the White House. But 
um, we're still trying. And that's what today's uh, rallies were all about, trying to highlight that need. Well, I know that's why we, you know, kind of urgently put together today's webinar yeah. because, you know, it's it's not that anything is a fake complete. It's just yeah. a matter of making sure that stakeholders in uh, the Midwest understand what is at stake and kind of the current state of affairs. Um, Representative Nago, before we switch over to our slides, is there anything you'd like to say about the um, rallies that happened today? Well, I just think it's important to highlight that these are real people, these are real jobs, and um, and maintaining uh, these this service is is key to for these people to continue to be employed. Um, I I think sometimes uh, federal government can become very short sighted on the uh, trickle down effect that occurs to uh, smaller communities. Um, this is not just saving money for Amtrak. This actually makes a lot of economic development loss in all of our, our rural communities. So um, it's it's quite an impact, and that's what's frustrating is that they're, I don't think they're seeing the bigger picture that we have to deal with. Well, thank you, and and I apologize. I was trying to um, get the slides up while we spoke, so I'm sorry to the viewers if um, if the screen changed in the middle of <laughs> Representative Nagel's comments. So uh, can you see the slides on your screen yep. now? Yep. Excellent. So I know I kind of touched on what MIPRC is, but um, maybe you can expand a little bit, let our viewers understand the organization. Sure, absolutely. I'll, I'll go, Kelly. Thank you. Um, uh, as you mentioned, Midwest Interstate Passenger Rail Commission, uh, the MIPRC, it's, it's, it's basically a coalition of Midwest states, like, like the slide says, um, member states and partners promoting, coordinating, and supporting passenger rail service uh, throughout the Midwest. That involves development and implementation of plans and, and planning projects, improvements for Midwest service, advocacy for Midwestern interests regarding passenger rail, supporting our individual state DOTs uh, and their passenger rail plans, and then provide leadership in FRA-led uh, regional planning efforts. Um, it's a coalition. We know, we know that when you, uh, when you get together with other like-minded groups and, and, and whatnot, in this case being Midwestern states, that um, when you apply for federal funding or, or grants or whatnot, um, it's much better if you have more uh, at stake, uh, more interest, and we think MIPRC has done a wonderful job in that uh, over the years and glad to, glad to be part of that. Um, who is MIPRC? The next slide, you'll see the member states that we have uh, in MIPRC. There's currently eight member states. Uh, you see them there, Iowa, Nebraska, Ohio, and South Dakota are also eligible um, to join and some have, have previously. Um, but as you can see, and, and we'll get to some maps shortly, that those eight states make up the MIPRC and advocate simply for improved, increased, expanded uh, passenger rail service uh, throughout the Midwest. And speaking of one of those maps, where is the MIPRC uh, region? Um, as you'll see in the next slide, that is the Amtrak long distance routes in the Midwest. Um, on the right there is the names of the trains that operate throughout the Midwest on the long distance service. You can just see that, that web, so to speak, coming out of, of Chicago and, and what that means for all those states. And even those states that aren't part of the MIPRC, you can see long distance routes still running through those states, uh, beneficial to those rural communities. Uh, the next slide is uh, more Bob, of the state. I gonna, yes. I was just gonna remind our viewers, you know, for the Alliance that focuses on the Milwaukee, Chicagoland, Northwest Indiana corridor, and we work regularly, you know, in the state capitals of all three states, although we are a not-for-profit, so we don't do any lobbying or advocacy, but it's important for our stakeholders to see this map, um, this regional map and the train service, and to really understand the importance of this train service to the mega region, to our stakeholders, as well as the whole viewing yeah. audience. So I really appreciate um, you sharing that map and helping people understand, you know, kind of the overlap between our organization and yours. That's a good point. Great point, Kelly. And then the next slide, if you think back to the, the long distance route, these are the state supported routes among the Midwest, and you have all the, the routes there. Again, Chicago serving it as the Midwest hub and, and all the service that, that sprinkles out of that 
or webs out uh, from Chicago. Now, going back to sort of our conversation before and why we held the rallies uh, today, the Midwest service cut or the, the long distance service cuts are surely going to affect state supported service uh, as well. Um, and state supported services where we've really, really grown ridership um, over the course of the last decade or so, um, especially in the state of Illinois, uh, it's where I'm from. Uh, we increased service uh, twofold in the mid 2000s um, on four or three downstate routes. We added four trains um, and ridership uh, went through the roof. Um, when you expand service, uh, you grow ridership. And just conversely, when we're talking about cutting service on the long distance routes, when you cut that service, you're, you're hurting ridership. Um, and that's the problem we come to today due to COVID. Um, you know, when Amtrak is setting yearly ridership records, and now you see because of the, the pandemic, ridership down 95%. Um, and then that last bullet point there that we have, you know, nearly 2,000 um, union employees will be uh, furloughed starting tomorrow, possibly, uh, should those cuts uh, go through. And again, management employees are going to feel that, um, as well as trickle-down effects on these rural communities that are going to lose uh, service. Um, so I mentioned the rallies earlier today, Kelly. Um, that's, that's the really important part we want to emphasize here is, is its jobs. And we, we talked about it today, and then I'll let Sharon start in on the economic side of things. But, you know, we talked about the passengers, you know, obviously we, we, we care about our own jobs and everything, but we care about the passengers we serve. And we know they're, they're, they're really going to be looking for, um, you know, that service to hopefully come back soon if, if those cuts do indeed take place. But um, Sharon knows the economic stuff much more than I do. So I'll hand it off to her for the remainder of the slides. And I thank you, Kelly and everyone. Thanks, Bob, and we will invite um, the audience to use the Q&A button to answer questions. Um, so they can ask questions and I will relay them, but let's um, bring in Representative Nagel and tell us about these really stark numbers with the estimated economic losses. Sure, so you know, here, here are the stark numbers that we're gonna experience and we don't even know, we hope not to experience it, let's put it that way. But we don't even know, for example, uh, the Indiana data yet. Um, so this is not the complete picture. But you know, looking at the impact by state, I mean, we're up to at this point, we're up to over a half a million. And uh, you know, there are always uh, some indirect effects that are very difficult to quantify. Um, so uh, my concern is is that really this isn't the full picture, but at least this is what we can put together right now and have a feel for. I mean, obviously, Illinois is um, always going to be the hardest hit because it's the hub. Um, and then the frustration, of course, is, is that we are also, you know, how, how all of these long distance routes affect our state run routes. I mean, they they all work together in a very coordinated effort. So when a piece of the puzzle is broken, um, it just disrupts the entire process um, and creates uncertainty amongst travelers. And all of us know the critical nature of certainty when it comes to travel. And, and Representative Nagel, for those that may be calling in and not seeing the screen, can you just give us an idea of, you know, we're talking hundreds of millions of dollars in both direct losses and indirect effects. How do you measure um, the indirect effects? So, uh, the, you know, there's always um, different uh, ways in which we measure it. And I, you know, it's, it's a half, half a billion is what we're looking at. I apologize, I it just completely said that number wrong. Um, uh, so the uh, uh, the whole point is, is that, you know, the direct loss obviously has to do with um, um, the uh, employees and the stations and all of those things that we can quantify very easily. Um, but indirects are always, come, comes along with, you know, who's along the routes and what those companies that are being affected that typically get uh, business from, from these routes. Um, can be restaurants, can be stores that are nearby. I mean, those are all of your indirect effects that are gonna occur. Um, so th there's metrics in, w in, w in which they do this and they're, they're able to track it through uh, sales tax collections, uh, you know, income tax collections, et cetera. So, um, so this, these, you know, there's no exactness in these numbers, but it certainly is uh, a metric that's quantifiable. 
Right, right. And, and the ridership uh, loss numbers, those two are very alarming. Correct. So, so, you know, again, when you start again, looking at the numbers of people, that's another metric that they use to quantify what the, what the losses are dollar wise. So a, a half a billion, what we can quantify at this point. Um, but again, we were missing some data on, on, on especially Indiana. And looking at the, the total amount of ridership, I mean, it's, it's obviously it's annualized. Um, but uh, again, it, our hub in Illinois and Chicago is what, you know, it's drastically affected. So the solution. The solution is that we obviously need additional funding. And uh, we are in the, pro all of us should be in the process of contacting uh, our Congress and making sure that we are fully funded. Um, on Monday, the, the House leadership announced the, the 2.2 trillion COVID relief package which includes the stimulus um, is the additional funding for this, the stipulations that we've sought to prevent these cuts for the long distance service. Um, the bill provides an additional 2.4 billion in additional funding for Amtrak. So it's very critical that MIPPERC and all of the members uh, that are related to, to the rail industry need to contact your, your members of Congress and, and provide the uh, necessary push to get this passed and get it passed through. So um, with the 2.4 billion that is, you're saying is part of the 2.2 trillion um, bill, I mean, is, is that enough to stabilize things? I think it's enough to get us to a certain point. <laughs> question is, is, you know, right, how, how long will that last? That's a fair question to ask. But we know that uh, uh, if, if Congress provides us additional funding for fiscal year 2021, um, and then that, that would be, in a, you know, and above the $2 billion currently in the THUD continuing resolution, um, we should be able to, to continue operating. And, and, and again, I know this is all happening in real time and, you know, over the course of, of 48, 72 hours. So it's very understandable if you don't know the answer. But I'll ask in case you do. Do you know if there's any, you know, strings attached? So if Congress provides this 2.4 billion, and ultimately, you know, I know that's in the House bill, if, if somewhere in that, you know, ballpark is awarded to Amtrak, have there been any um, commitments by Amtrak to, you know, not fire people to to maintain its workforce? Bob might have a better idea on this one. <laughs> I'll, uh, Kelly, I, 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 it's we're running close against, uh, you know what those plan cuts are and why October 1st means so much in the Amtrak world is that's the beginning of their fiscal year 21. Um, so that's why these these cuts would begin tomorrow, the beginning of their fiscal year. But I believe Amtrak ha has, has on good faith efforts told the congressional leadership and whatnot that if this funding comes in, you know, later in the week, next week, if agreement can be put in place, they can get back up and rolling to daily frequencies, um, thus, avoiding most of the harm of any kind of furloughs or layoffs that might occur. It's the longer that this funding um, escapes us would, would present the problems um, in, in recalling employees, employee qualifications, um, getting the service back up and running to where it was before. So in the very short term, if an agreement can be had shortly, there's good faith discussion that, that, that really the most negative effects will be avoided it's the longer this drags on where it becomes a real problem. Got it. So um, as I you know, did invite the audience to ask questions, I'm gonna relay those to you. And again, with the caveat that if, the, um, if Mr. Guy or Representative Nagel are not able to answer your questions, if they're very detail oriented, we will be sure to have MIPRC um, reach out to you and get you answers. So the first question is, are you aware that since early May, LD trains provide more revenue to Amtrak than the NEC and state supported trains combined? Any comments? Yes, that, that's, 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 that is appropriate and that is good. The, the national network did not have as steep a decline as the Northeast Corridor or state supported service. Um, just, the reasoning for that, mostly the Northeast Corridor is very, very frequent mostly business travelers. Um, so really with the height of the pandemic and when that began back in March, 
you know, there wasn't a lot, if, if little to any business travel whatsoever. Your state supported service, while there's a, a lot of uh, business travel on that, it also is a lot of college students in the Midwest and specifically in Illinois. Colleges shut down in March with the beginning of the pandemic and across the Midwest and are just now, you know, coming back online over the last month or so. So the long distance travel uh, did not show that steep as decline. And with that less steep decline, actually was able to provide more revenue. I believe that was to the question. Okay, thank you. Uh, Representative Nagel, anything that you would like to say from, the, uh, from your um, state position? Well, just, I just would add that um, the language is in that bill that they would have to maintain the daily service. So that is part of the language. Okay, so that, that's really helpful. And again, I invite the audience to submit questions through the Q&A button. And I see that we have um, a, a, a really more of a statement just saying that the House Democrats new bill prohibits Amtrak from making long distance cuts. So that of course is exactly what, um, what we're wanting um, to talk about today. Yes, so yes. from your experience um, with COVID, what do you see kind of the, the future of rail? Like when we're in the kind of the recovery standpoint, you made a comment that they were having record um, ridership before COVID. Yeah. Maybe you can share a little bit about kind of pre-COVID just so people understand. Well, uh, pre-COVID, and again, the Midwest and uh, MIPRC as a partner ha have put so much into, and all, and, and let me be clear too, there's many, many passenger rail partners out there um, that have helped with, within the efforts um, to grow passenger rail um, in Illinois and the Midwest in general. Um, but there's just been a, a, a much, uh, much needed and incremental ridership increase year after year after year. And in Illinois, it came after big jumps in the mid 2000s when we expanded service. Um, but you've got a younger generation specifically on your state supported service that aren't attached to their cars, like say I was at that age. You've got college students who, you know, if you take the Chicago St. Louis corridor, just an example, and I've been on there many, many times, sometimes they reserve two cars alone for Illinois State University students. And they get in their seat and they plug in their phone, they get their computer out, they're staying connected. Uh, they're, they're not attached to that steering wheel um, you know, like we were. Um, so that is what drove ridership, you know, specifically on the state supported service. Um, and then when you give people more frequencies, better on time performance, and more ways to actually utilize the system, that, that, that drives ridership as well. And, and Representative Nagel, um, from Indianapolis's standpoint, I mean, what are you hearing from your colleagues about their concern around potential cuts? So right now, uh, we are in the process of updating our state rail plan. Um, so my concern is how uh, this eventually is going to affect uh, our growth back into some of the passenger rail that we've lost uh, in, the, for example, the Hoosier. Um, but we are also in the big process of our uh, northern region and double tracking and adding uh, an additional uh, leg that goes down to Dyer. Um, and those, I, I'm hoping that there's not going to be any interruptions to that process because we expect those to be up and running in 2023 and 2024. Um, uh, with those put in place, the additional growth that we would see would, would come back to uh, adding to the Cardinal line, which is our, 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 our uh, long distance train. So it's all, in the, it's all part of that big uh, picture on how we're gonna expand. And uh, my concern is that it's uh, going to create, create some, a, a snag in our development. Well, I see that we have um, another question and it reads, do you think people will come back and ride the trains up to previous ridership levels? Aren't people going to be afraid to congregate so closely on trains? Well, I, I certainly hope so. Um, I think both Amtrak and then in the Chicago area for our discussion here, you know, Metro, we see the campaign about how, how they're cleansing, cleaning trains, sanitizing them. Um, social distancing is probably going to be around for a while. So this is probably not going to be a quick ridership recovery. Um, but as we get back to more normal or what normal will mean after COVID, um, you know, we believe that that ridership will come back on all the three legs of Amtrak, Northeast Corridor, 
state supported service in your long district long distance network yeah we had on our webinar series yesterday the head of the chicago loop alliance and they talked about how they always did their best to keep downtown you know clean um, yeah. but now they have you know increased the commitment to you know cleaning things more regularly spraying down um, streets and and cable tops do you see with amtrak having you know that increased uh, commitment into cleaning the cars and the seats in between um, you know, rides, uh, you know, morning, noon, and night. What, have, what are they doing to make sure that it's safe to ride? Well, they, they are doing that, that very thing that you mentioned, Kelly. Uh, this is the, the equipment that they're using now. Um, one of the things with the downturn and, and with less frequencies out there right now, you have a chance to rotate equipment and be able to get in and deep, thoroughly clean uh, the equipment before it goes back out. Um, so that is being done um, as equipment comes in, sanitizing down, um, and then before it goes out, another wipe down, and then you social distance requirements, masking requirements on the train. So that's just the world we live in right now, and we hope to get back to some normalcy as soon as possible. Sure. Um, there's another question that uh, has been submitted, and it reads, if the $2.2 billion for Amtrak in this updated HEROES Act is not enacted, could these required additional funds be included as part of the FY21 appropriations? For instance, the currently uh, passed House 20, FY21 appropriations level for Amtrak included $8 billion in emergency appropriations, although the Senate has not yet released its version of the FY21 Amtrak appropriations. So again, I think the heart of the question is, you know, what happens if it doesn't go through with the HEROES Act? I'm not I've sure been, if I know that answer. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's where, that, where, where we're just so up in the air right now on everything and everything's focused on the emergency funding to avoid these cuts and furloughs and, and the loss of the rural ser service and, and then the negative effects on state and NEC service as well. Um, there is an appropriation out there. Uh, this would be on top of that under okay. the HEROES Act. If the HEROES Act, you know, this additional funding package doesn't, there's not an agreement, then we have to go back to the drawing board for uh, 21 uh, appropriation, additional 21 appropriation, um, just like it's, it's sitting there now. So just to make sure that everybody is, that we're all clear on, on what you're helping us understand is, for right now, for fiscal year 2020, the funding is in place and that's not going to change. But what we're fighting about now is, is for 2021. And in addition to what would be kind of the regular schedule budget, we're asking for additional funds, mainly maybe because revenue has decreased because ridership, people aren't riding because of COVID. It, it, does that sum things up? Yes, and that additional funding um, and, and anything we can't get to, I want to mention that Laura Clear, our executive director, is on the, the line here listening to the question, so, she, so she's helping out. We asked for that additional funding, MIPRC did, in the, the regular appropriation to stay out of this kind of situation. Um, that didn't take place, and here we are now with needing the emergency funding in another COVID package. I see. But, and as you mentioned, um, the executive director of MIPRC, she is really a subject matter expert and lives and breathes um, all of these issues. And um, the stakeholders are so lucky to have her leadership. Yes. And so those that are watching, you know, please be sure um, to go to the MIPRC website, um, get on their mailing list, follow them on Twitter. And that is um, probably the best way to stay on top of this you know, very fast moving train, no pun yeah. intended. <laughs> <laughs> so I see that we are um, down to only about 30 seconds left. So let me just ask um, Representative Nagel, any closing comments? Well, just remember, passing yeah. the rail is all about it's, you know, it's just too short to fly and too long to drive. We need passenger rail and we have to be conscious of uh, the residual effect all throughout our country when you shut down these long distance rail lines. It's, it's just critical. So hopefully we can uh, get Congress to understand that uh, this is not just saving because you're going to lay off a bunch of people at Amtrak. This is much bigger than that. 
Great. And, and Bob, closing comments? I just add on to what Representative Nagel said. Um, the, the, the ramifications for all this are, are, are scary um, because of the trickle down effect. Um, you know, in Indiana, Amtrak has the Beach Grove facility that takes care of locomotives and whatnot. Um, when you start cutting off trains, that means possible, you know, workforce reductions in, in, in her state, in Illinois, in our state, and across the Midwest. Um, really scary stuff. Um, you know, we can't be getting cars off of roads when we're, you know, reducing our passenger rail service, much like transit. You know, uh, Amtrak provides, you know, safe, reliable service um, in the Midwest. Uh, you know, we see it from college students, you know, who don't want to drive back and forth home. Um, as well as other business travelers, um, which helps, you know, traffic congestion and whatnot. So uh, all the stakeholders out there, please do whatever you can to, to, to stay on our congressional leadership uh, to get the ball across the finish line here. And Kelly, thank you. Oh, thank you. So I, I know we're now um, a little past three o'clock. I appreciate both of you spending your time um, educating our stakeholders and reminding everybody to follow through and contact your representatives and your senators and make sure they know that it's important for our Midwest to have this very important train service. Um, I'd like to invite everybody to join us again next week when we have our webinars on Tuesday and Thursday. Tuesday, we're gonna be talking about the Affordable Care Act from an expert healthcare lawyer who is, um, has experience arguing cases in front of the United States Supreme Court, and he has some very important insights on what should be expected with the ACA with a new court. And then on Thursday, we're going to hear from Illinois State Comptroller on uh, the Illinois budget. So it's gonna be uh, some really important information. Watch your emails and register. Thank you for spending time with us today. Stay well, stay strong. Thank you, Bob. Thank you, Representative. Thank you. We look forward to seeing Thank you. you soon. Follow us Thank on you. Twitter. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>